Um, now we'll look at classifications because we all see a lot of stuff about classifications. This is the, uh, we use the white system. It's Frederick White was a, an engineer, mechanical engineer in the New York Central. He said back around the turn of the century, he says, we gotta, we gotta get something here because this is complicated. People, we gotta figure out some way. And so he came up with the, the numbering system that we use for steam locomotives. The, the lead truck is here. And you have to have like passenger engines have to have four wheels up here because you have to pull that engine around. That's a lot of mass, a lot of inertia, and you have to pull that engine around the curve. And if they didn't have it, um, they, they learn very quickly. You, you, you got to have, especially if the track is rough, you got to have a lead truck. Now the axle loading on these is about half or less of the drivers, but it's enough to pull the engine. Then you have the drivers that are driven by the pistons. That's the middle number. And then in back is the trailing truck. And that's for two, does two things. One is it supports the firebox. And also if the engine has to back up, it, 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 it allows the engine to, to uh, negotiate curves going back. Now in the UK, they were using, um, they go by axles. So a, a Pacific is a two, three, one. And then they came up with a UIC code. I think that comes from the continent of Europe. Uh, and the powered, it's, it's actually a good system. The, so your idler uh, axles are, are just numbers. And then your powered axles, no matter what's powering them, uh, in this case, it's a, it's a Pacific locomotive. So you have two axles, idler axles, and you have C means three powered axles. And then one is one idler axle. And then uh, guess what? We use that for diesels because a BB is two axles powered and then in front and two axles in back. Uh, a passenger engine, in the olden days was an A1A, A1A. That means there was a, a motor and then the center axle didn't have a motor and then the back axle had a motor. And then of course, most of them now are CCs, which means three, three motors in front, three motors in back. Interestingly, uh, General Electric is now making freight locomotives that are A1A. And they have this exotic system to unload the center axle when they start the train. And then once they get going, they only need four motors. So it cuts down on maintenance. So the Burlington Northern's got some of those. Not they don't use those on coal and heavy trains, but for the for manifest, they, they work pretty well. And then there's a, this is the four wheel uh, lead truck. And uh, the American we talked about, the Atlantic and the Jubilee was the 444, Redding made them. And so did the Canadian Pacific, they had some, some of those. Here's the American. And um, then we get to the 10 wheeler, the Pacific, the Hudson, the 12 wheeler is a 480. They had those early in the 1900s. Um, and most railroads didn't keep them, but the Norfolk and Western ran those things for 50 years. They ran them right till the end of the 50s. They had a really good, they had some good locomotives. Um, the 482, uh, that's now we have a, uh, that's a mountain. Um, and of course, on the, uh, on the New York Central, they called the Mohawks because they didn't have any mountains. So, and then Northern Pacific asked uh, for a great war, and that, that's why they call it a Nor uh, Northern. And they had all sorts of names. Every railroad had their own name. The New York Central called them Niagara's. Down south, of course, they couldn't be Northern, so they had to be Dixie's. And uh, the Richford, Richmond. Fredericksburg and Potomac called them presidents and you know everybody had a different name so but here's the Pennsylvania K4 Pacific and they had like 450 of them standardized it was a it was a very good locomotive and they ran them for for right up into the into the 50s and here's a here's a Pacific on the um, uh, on the Sioux line uh, here's the Hudson now that came along a little later the New York Central said well let's put a bigger firebox on and so we'll make it a four, six, four. And then we got to the four, eight, four. Here's the really famous one. That's the um, Union Pacific. That's a four, eight, four and big tender. And they would, uh, they would lope along just fine with a passenger train or freight. And the eight, four, four uh, never was retired. It's been in continuous service since 1950. So they still use it for obviously for excursions and stuff now, but. Uh, then we get into the Mastodon, the Southern Pacific, um, and that was basically taking a, uh, uh, 
you know, basically a, it's a big um, freight and steam locomotive. And then the Union Pacific had a 4122 that Alco built for them. And it, even though I had 12 drivers and they had to have a lot of lateral support, we'll look at a picture of one in a minute. And uh, because it, it, it was hard to make something like that go around a curve. Right. <laughs> and, the, and then uh, on the bottom there is the Bright Spur Bahn. Uh, I had never heard about this. Bob, you probably have heard about this. The Nazis were building this super train, 13, point, 13 foot, six inch gauge, double deck trains. Now it was a great idea, actually, if they'd done it, it would, it would have been- You could carry immense amounts of war material to the front. Yes, yes. Which was the whole point of having the railroad in World War II. That's exactly right. So, uh, but anyway, here's the four. No, I wasn't too up on that. I was aware they had a failed experiment, but I, I'd never seen. I actually, they had a picture on Google of, of it. Uh, here's the four twelve two, and uh, they they were a little nervous about putting uh, twelve drivers there, but but they these these drivers in the middle. Whoops, sorry. Um, these drivers in the middle have all sorts of lateral support because otherwise you wouldn't obviously wouldn't be able to get around a curve. But they had like 88 of them. They then they ran them from Cheyenne to Omaha and from from uh, Kansas City to Denver, and they were very successful. But they figured out that they needed to have something a little bit more flexible, <coughs> and that's what led to the challenger, the four six six four, where you where you take each set, you have two sets of six drivers rather than one uh, set of twelve. The other problem they ran into is the rods got so heavy, because now you got all this you know, 4,000 horsepower going, going down this rod. And so they had to put a third cylinder in the middle. And so that, that cut the weight drum. And then they had to put a crank on this thing. So the third cylinder feeds this driver and then the, the main, uh, main rods feed this driver. But they were very successful. Wow. Huh. And, they, and then the Pennsylvania was going right at the end. They were a big coal hauler. So they tried to keep coal going right to the end. And they, they it was got cheap it. for them. Huh? Cheap. For them. Oh, yeah, it was cheap. Absolutely. Um, and they were in love with it. And so they came up with this like, concept of a duplex drive. Now, this is one frame. These are not articulated, but they, they, they ran steam. It's a 4 4 6 4. They ran steam to both cylinders at the same time. Uh, these are a little bigger because it's, it's driving six wheels. But, but uh, very efficient. I think they were like 8,000 horsepower, huge firebox. It was a huge locomotive, very efficient. But as we've seen, uh, they, they, uh, they built quite a few of them. I think they had 50 of them or something. And they ran, but they, they, even that, they couldn't keep, compete with the diesels. So they eventually disappeared in the 50s. And then here's the, the bright spoor bond. Um, so there's a, there's a regular uh, German... Uh, Looks like a, a decapod, um, and then here's this bright spoor bond, the concept. And they they were gonna they had the lines all designed and everything. Going to build them all over Germany, and here here's a picture of it. Double deck, thirteen foot gauge. Boy, you could really haul some stuff on that thing. Whew. But that was Hitler's idea. He really wanted to push that. So, but he was big on huge things. Yes, yeah. He was. They were talking the thousand year right. Yeah. So, um, okay, then we got into the articulated. The um, big ones are the 2660 on the Denver and Salt Lake, and then the uh, uh, Norfolk and Western uh, late in the game built 2664s that were very good, and the, and the uh, Chesapeake and Ohio had the 2666. Here's the 2660 on the uh, Denver and Salt Lake. And they needed that because they, they went up over Rollins Pass, which was replaced by the Moffat Tunnel. But they had that sometimes five of these things to push a train over the pass. Just pure tractive effort at, at seven miles an hour. Here is a 2664. And this one is Baltimore, Ohio. Norfolk and Western had them. Uh, Seaboard had them. Quite a few railroads were, were uh, it basically replaced two locomotives. Here's the 2666, and that's from our friends at Lima, from Lima, Ohio. And uh, where was that? Lima? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they, they built a huge firebox under this thing, 
And uh, so it's two, six, 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 and the, they needed a six axle truck and it pulled really well. And, uh, and, but then they waited and they found out it was about 50,000 pounds overweight. So, but fortunately <laughs> the, the, the C and O had really good tracks so they could run them. They, they used them very heavily. And then the last ones are the, uh, the Yellowstone we're familiar with. That's the, the, um, the it was named after the Northern Pacific because they asked for it to run across North Dakota, the undulating up and down track. Uh, and then of course, Pensy tried the steam turbine, trying to put, you know, get some of that efficiency. So here's the, uh, um, the Yellowstone. And they were so successful that a number of other railroads bought them, including the Duluth Mesabi and Iron Range who ran them well into the 60s. Because these things would, would take 180 loaded uh, iron ore cars from Northern Minnesota down to Proctor. 14,000 or was it higher? 14,000 pounds or was it higher? Yeah, 14,000 tons, yeah. Tons, yeah, yeah 14, tons. tons yeah. Unbelievable. And then the final one are the Challenger, uh, the big boy, which we've heard a lot about. A buyer Garrett, if you remember that steam that uh, steam video I put out when I was in South Africa, that that was a buyer Garrett. That was two eight eight two. And then uh, Southern Pacific turned the two eight eight two two eight eight four around and made it a four eight eight two, which we'll look at in a second. So here's the the Challenger. Um, uh, this is a Northern Pacific. They bought them. The Union Pacific had them. Uh, the Delaware and Hudson had some, which was interesting for a smaller railroad to buy them. Here's the uh, here's the Southern Pacific, their oil burner. So they just turned them around for Donner's Pass. They had all those snow sheds and and uh, and and tunnels. And of course, here's the big boy. We've seen that one a lot. That was a good move getting that thing running. Here's the Erie Triplex. It was a good idea in theory, but uh, um, the boiler just couldn't produce enough steam. And so they, they used it as a pusher on some of their grades um, because it could only go about 10 miles an hour and run out of steam. Here's the Pensy steam turbine. So instead of having piston, they had this turbine mm -hmm. running uh, sideways right here. And, uh, but it, uh, it ran for a couple of years, but it, again, couldn't, couldn't, you're losing all that heat from boiling the water. So, well, that's it. And next month we'll do part two. We'll look at some pictures of steam locomotives. <clears throat> so any questions? One, one, one comment I, I had um, thinking about all this history is um, that the, the Romans knew about steam yeah. and, they knew, and they knew how powerful it was and they were starting to think about how they could use it to, uh, you know, pull chariots or wagons or something. And, um, but, but then with all the politics and running into the dark ages and everything, they, that, that didn't happen. However, um, I think if it had happened back then, let's say what happened in 1825, um, happened in 825 um we we would have had i think our our age of technology a, a thousand years sooner than we did and what would have been interesting about that is that we would that we would have had those advances in the technology with a lot fewer people on the earth yes and and i think that would have been um, an interesting uh, set of circumstances because right now we're just trying to figure out how can we um, keep our technology ahead of our population growth. Yes. You know, it's a race, it seems like. We're trying to figure out all these climate issues and all the damage we're causing and and a lot of it's because of how so many people we have wanting to live at a, a very um, high, you know, high level of, of life. So um, I, I often wondered if, if, the, if the Romans 
had figured things out. They were such good engineers. Um, how Western history might have changed or been different. I wonder if those would have been copper engines. They had <laughs> steel, but they didn't have it in quantity. So I wonder, would that have driven a steel industry to have more steel around? I, I Whether think it's wrought iron or whatever, but my point I think is- metallur metallurgy would have advanced- Along um, with. Fairly along with it, yeah, Bob, yeah. I, I think so. And so many discoveries um, that, that have been made because of railroading in the 1800s and 1900s would have been made if railroading um, had occurred a thousand years earlier. Right. So it's, That's it's kind of fun. Interesting, interesting thought. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, because uh, we, we were watching a thing about the, um, the library in Alexandria and this professor was right. saying that basically the knowledge in the world um, dropped by half between between uh, 100 AD and and uh, 800 AD, because yeah. they burned that library, they burned a lot of books. Um, uh, many many areas, learning was not was not uh, promoted. So yeah, yeah, yeah. One yeah. thing that we did we <clears throat> did get from the Romans is um, um, the uh, I think those the gauge between the wheels of the chariots was four feet six and a half and, <laughs> and uh, we're back to the two horses so, butts yes yeah right so so when the, when the english um decided to, to start build railroads they figured well we'll just do do it so we could run our you know our carts and our wagons and stuff on on the rails and uh that's there that width was from the Romans. Yeah. <laughs>